and I am not stopping. I made a commitment to you all. I am going to re-up that commitment. I am not stopping until we get these issues resolved or I have a heart attack. So here we go, duplication of benefits. Now let me grab some of the notes that I went through and did on this. Um, as you all know, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development released um, 53 pages of, um, of guidance documents uh, for duplication of benefits. Um, let's see. Okay, okay. Um, So I went through and typed up all kinds of responses and notes, and we've got a letter uh, going to Secretary Carson on this. Um, look, let me, let, me, let me kind of go through a few things. Uh, first of all, um, I, I, I am, um, I'll just say I'm happier uh, that they release something uh, than if we were continuing to wait. Um, uh, so that's one thing. Uh, number two. For a, a significant portion of the duplication of benefits victims, they have laid out a path that those folks can move forward or that the state, I guess, can move forward to ultimately pay those people. So second thing, I, think, I do think that's good news. Number three, people that were declined or shot down because they applied for a loan but didn't accept it, um, accepted a loan but didn't take it, took only part of it, they did issue clarifying guidance for that. Now, uh, that was fixed in the law back in, what was it, February of seven, no, 18, excuse me, 18. They finally issued the guidance on that. Um, they have a provision in there that allows the state to go through a waiver process whereby possibly uh, you could have your interest payments on your duplicate, on your small business administration loan covered, the portion of your interest payments that are outstanding. Now, one thing about that that bothers me, um, well, I'll tell you what, before I get to the bothersome stuff, I'll, I'll just, let me, let me think what else, let's see. Um, oh, they also made one tweak about the dates, which they kind of had to do, but about the effective dates for when you could get reimbursed by. So, so all those things I, I think are positive. Um, uh, that's steps in the right direction and, 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 it, and it lays out a process. Now, here's where um, they, they absolutely missed the mark. Uh, number one, and, and I'm going to get into the weeds a little bit. I'm really sorry. I know a lot of y'all know these weeds even better than I do because you're, you're so uh, in tune to this. But number one, uh, this whole AMI thing, what that is, is that is, a, that is an average income for our area. Um, and, and they have added this criteria for, for uh, AMI and basically saying if you are over 120% of AMI, um, then you are not eligible for Restore Louisiana. You continue to be boxed out by duplication of benefits. Now, I will tell you why um, that is flawed and why it is illegal. And I'm going to say that again, illegal. Um, it is flawed because this program, the whole program that's funding, the federal funds that is funding the, the, the Restore Louisiana program, those dollars are, they're all federal funds that you are supposed to prioritize with those funds, low and moderate income. Let me be clear, prioritize, not exclusivity. So, so you're supposed to prioritize low and moderate income individuals, not exclusively fund them. The way that they address that low and moderate income issue is that they set a percentage. They say that X percentage of your funds has to go toward low and moderate income folks. Now you can average it out. You have somebody low income, somebody high income, they can potentially average out. That's how a lot of folks have been able to get uh, payments to restore Louisiana. Um, that percentage is 55% in Louisiana. So, so there already is a way for the Restore Louisiana program, program to comply with the, with the low and moderate income requirement or prioritization. What HUD has done is they have introduced new criteria to determine a way to, to meet this LMI. Well, if it didn't apply before, and you're bringing it in now, what you're doing effectively is you are, you are um, contradicting the law because you're determining that duplication of benefits does, does continue to apply to a large sector of the, the population, the duplication of benefits population. Well, well, wait a minute. The law explicitly says that, that the president may not determine that a law, excuse me, that a loan 
is duplicative of a grant. It explicitly says it. It says, notwithstanding this section, the president may not determine that a loan is duplicative of a grant. Well, that is exactly what HUD has done. They have determined that for certain income individuals, that a loan is in fact duplicative of a grant. That is illegal, it is contradictory to the law. I am having a call with the attorney that has this lawsuit out there now, and we're gonna be going through this. I am also working with HUD. I'm gonna work both paths. I'm gonna to continue to. I'm gonna say this again. What HUD has issued in the guidance is flat out black and white illegal. Now let me add some emphasis to that point. If, if, if someone did not even apply for a loan, if they didn't even apply for an SBA loan, and they applied to restore Louisiana, the AMI did not apply to them. If they already got their check. So what HUD is further doing is they're actually discriminating against a certain segment of the population that are making the same income or maybe even less than the income of people that maybe didn't ever apply for an SBA loan, but did apply for the Restore Louisiana grants. I hope all this makes sense. I know I'm getting the weeds, but, but, but look, this is really frustrating and we've dug in on this. I've been working on this for over two years. I know y'all have been even more frustrated than I am because you're paying these checks, but this is, it's illegal what they're doing. Their guidance is fatally flawed and I am not stopping. I made a commitment to y'all. I am gonna re-up that commitment. I am not stopping until we get these issues resolved or I have a heart attack. Um, two options for you. Um, so, so we're gonna continue doing that. Um, now, um, I, I hope all that made sense, but, but, but that's what's going on and we're working both with HUD and we're working with the attorney to get that issue resolved. Secondly, um, what HUD says in their guidance is that you have to do a, a total needs assessment. You have to, and, and there was already a total needs assessment done on you whenever you applied the first time. They did a total needs assessment. Now, the reason HUD said this is needed, which is a whole other bureaucratic process, wasting additional money, the contractor that's administering the Restore Louisiana program is already getting $300 million. $300 million. Now, what do you think is going to happen whenever they have to go back through and go back and do a needs assessment on all of you again? They're going to go charge the state even more money. That is ridiculous. It is a bureaucratic step, and let me explain why. It is a total, just bureaucratic step. It is a waste of money. It is a waste of time. Because under current law, current law says that you cannot double recover. In the agreement that you all signed with SBA, it says if you are given funds that compensate anything you've paid for or been approved for under your SBA loan, you have to repay under a grant that you got from FEMA, it says the same thing. Under flood insurance, it says the same thing. In fact, where, where's my, um, let me show you find it real quick. Here we go. Um, here's what um, the Stafford Act, this is the federal law that we amended with our duplication of benefits. It says, a person receiving federal assistance for a major disaster or emergency shall be liable to the United States to the extent that such assistance duplicates benefits available to the person for the same purpose from another source. So the law already says if, if you had a needs assessment and you got the money for it, if, if some other source came in and paid that, not, not if it was a friend or relative, but like if you got a flood insurance check and then you got a restore grant and then later on a FEMA grant came in, and you, you got more money than, than you actually had in losses, then, then you already, under your FEMA grant, under your, your Restore Louisiana grant, and under your SBA loan, and under federal law, all of the different contracts and federal law um, uh, re require, that, require that you have to pay the money back. So why are you asking for a total needs assessment, a, re a redone needs assessment? Your needs are the same as they were back then, when you have them done the first time. And if they're not, then you're breaking law and you're breaking these contracts, which I know y'all aren't doing. So this step is useless. It, it, it completely ignores the fact that you've signed contracts and agreements and that acknowledging what the federal law says. So 
There is no reason whatsoever to come back and do an updated needs assessment unless you're trying to prevent this from happening, trying to waste money, trying to pay a contractor rather than paying disaster victims. Let me tell you, we busted our butts to get the Restore Louisiana program $1.7 billion. I don't want a penny of it siphoned off for any other purpose other than to restore y'all's lives, your family, your homes, and, and, and those things. That's what we got it for. We got it for recovery, not to make people rich. So, um, so, so, so this whole let's take a fresh look at that at, at these people and the needs assessment thing. It's just bogus. Um, I know that I know that some of y'all had had talked about the the check being co-written to you and to the SBA. Um, you know, look. My preference would be that they give y'all maximum flexibility. Like I saw someone commented on you earlier, you you, in many cases, you, you know, because you didn't get sufficient funding, you maxed out your credit cards, or you may have taken a higher interest loan or whatever. I, I would prefer if if you had the flexibility to determine what your priorities are in terms. And provided that, and let me be clear, provided that you are using the money for an eligible recovery cost. Not if you wanted to, you know, go get steak at Ruth's Crest, but if, if, if you went to Outback, maybe it's okay, but not, no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, but, but, but look, for eligible expenses, um, for eligible recovery expenses, because that's what the law says. But, but I'd prefer if y'all had the discretion uh, to determine what the most urgent repayment or recovery need was, which may even be if you weren't, if you didn't get enough money to truly rebuild, is that to actually rebuild your house or finish uh, rehabbing your house. Let me just make make note of, of, of one of the other big things that I know that that many of y'all are interested in is the timeline. So, so, so timeline. So we've been talking to the state, and, and here's the deal: uh, under the guidance that that HUD's put together, this is kind of a third thing that I've got notes on. Uh, effectively, they're requiring the state to submit an updated action plan or an amendment to the action plan. Um, I, I really don't think that that should even have to happen because the state has already made it pretty clear on on what it is that they wanted to do with the funds the Restore Louisiana program has. Um, but they are going to have to submit an updated. Uh, they have to submit an updated plan. Um, the updated plan should be able to be done within two weeks. Um, my my two cents, and, and and part of this is going to depend upon if HUD really does make all these people come in and do all these updated needs assessments and all the, the sorry but crap. Um, uh, so so they should be able to do it in two weeks. If they're going to make them do all the updated assessments and everything else, then then it is going to be longer than, than than two weeks if they go through and do all the assessments all over again. Um, looking at the previous amount of time that it takes HUD to uh, approve the action plans. Um, historically, they've done it in somewhere from four to six to eight weeks, somewhere in that range. So, so look, it could be as short as uh, you know them submitting it in two weeks and then having you know maybe six to eight weeks to approve it. If, if they're going to go through and make them do all these needs assessments all over again, it is going to take the Restore Louisiana program longer to submit their modified plan, their their, their uh, action plan amendment to HUD, and then HUD will have six to eight weeks from then to approve it. So um, uh, I, I guess worst case scenario, look, I hesitate to give y'all timelines because HUD has repeatedly missed every deadline that even they've set. Um, uh, but, but, but something about a mid to, to late September, if they have to do all these updated needs assessments. Uh, so again, contingent upon that. Um, so that's kind of the, the timeline that I've got. Um, um, yeah, so that's kind of the, the, the that's kind of the update on on everything uh, duplication of benefits at this point. But let me let me reiterate something to y'all. One, I firmly believe that what HUD has done, it does discriminate, and it is it is it is HUD it is HUD contradicting itself uh, based on on who they made eligible before, who they're making eligible now. That is illegal. They are um, violating the law. And look, all these people say, well, what congressman? No, no, no. It is our bill. We wrote it. There's no senator that wrote it. This was us and Congressman Cedric Richmond. We were the only ones who wrote the bill. Um, and, the, 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 and, and, and that's it. So nobody's going to come tell me what my bill meant. Um, we know exactly what the bill meant. And when it has an explicit provision that says, notwithstanding any provision, uh, any of the, the relevant provisions of law, 
that the president may not determine that a loan is duplicative of a grant when they try and come in and apply this new criteria that was previously not applied and didn't apply to people that never applied for an SBA loan to begin with. That is discrimination and it is violating the law that I wrote and we busted our butts to pass after the Senate sat on it for 10 or 11 months. We had to pass it through the House three times. I am not stopping. And, and, and I know y'all's patience is wearing thin. I can't even imagine. But I want to be crystal clear on this. We are going to be pursuing this through the lawsuit and we're going to be pursuing this administratively. They are not complying with the law and they are discriminating. So if you're over 120% of AMI, I'm not stopping. But look, I, I do want to come back to the good stuff. There's a big chunk of the population that will be eligible for reimbursement and y'all will get it. Um, that includes people that are 100, below 120% of AMI, and it includes people that were in the declined loan category, meaning you declined the loan, or you didn't take the loan, or you didn't take the full loan. Um, they did include in the guidance uh, uh, pathways to, 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 to reimburse those folks. So there's a chunk of the population that will be fixed for the rest of you. We're in this together. I'm not stopping. And, and I told you the two options we're going with. And uh, so we'll keep working on this.